Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm back at Answers in Genesis Canada. Last time we left them, she promised she would explain transitional fossils from a creationist point of view, so rather than skip around in the playlist like I normally do, I decided to cover that one. So let's see how they explain them! I'm Patricia Engler, and today let's continue part two of two videos on so-called transitional fossils, which supposedly represent animals in intermediate stages of evolution. And of course, worth mentioning is that any organism that has offspring is technically a transitional organism, but what creationists focus on are the obvious representatives of two different groups, like Archaeopteryx being an example of the transition from non-avian to avian dinosaur, or Tiktaalik being an example of the transition from water to land. And as always, it is important to note that whatever species we have found that has been dubbed transitional is not necessarily, and indeed the odds are against it being, the actual ancestor of the modern group that it is said to be a transition toward. This is because the fossil record, as remarkable as it is, has likely not even preserved 99.9% .9 of the species that have ever existed, and of those that it does preserve, it is estimated that only one bone out of a billion gets preserved, meaning that if all of humanity were to die today, less than eight complete skeletons would make it into the fossil record. And really, it wouldn't be complete skeletons. Some bones are more likely to fossilize than others, and so there would be a bias towards the bigger, more dense bones. Now, I would make a joke here about how that means that the most likely bone to be fossilized would be the creationist skull, but that would be in poor taste, so I definitely wouldn't do that. We're at critical thinking check number six, looking at biblical interpretations for fossils. Yeah, we're looking at the biblical interpretation for these things that the Bible doesn't even bother to mention. I mean, unless you count the stories of dragons in the Bible as being imaginations based on fossil finds, but for some reason I don't think that's the typical creationist view on the matter. Genesis indicates God created organisms to reproduce according to their kinds, even if there's impressive variation within those kinds. What verse talks about there being impressive variation within those kinds? None that I'm aware of. But the Bible also forbids breeding your cattle with a different kind. Why would God bother prohibiting something that isn't possible anyway? May as well include a commandment about not running faster than the speed of sound while we're at it. So biblically, we can predict that for any transitional fossil claim, one of three things is probably happening. Scenario one, the fossil represents a specimen from either one kind or another kind, not something in between. Well. In between is a bit of a mislabel anyway, which is why I had to be specific with my language. I had to specify that Archaeopteryx represents the transition from non-avian to avian dinosaur. You can't just say it's the transition between dinosaurs and birds, because birds are dinosaurs. You can't say it's the transition between theropods and birds, because birds are theropods. It was simply the development of flight within an existing category. And that's really all that transitional fossils represent, the development of a new trait or suite of traits within an already existing category. Tiktaalik is not halfway between a fish and a terrestrial tetrapod, it's simply an organism that is a fish, but shows adaptations that would be useful for terrestrial tetrapods. Hell, in Tiktaalik's case, we know for sure that it was not the common ancestor of all terrestrial tetrapods, because we have terrestrial tetrapod tracks that predate Tiktaalik. It's just an example of how those adaptations could have developed. For instance, observational science reveals that so-called hominid or ape-man fossils are usually fully ape or fully human. Human evolution is actually one of the more well-represented transitions out there, and if you look at the lineup of skulls, you can clearly see the development from less human to more human, and each skull in the lineup is not much different from the one that comes before it or after it. The differences are so small that I would be willing to bet that if you showed them to a creationist without telling them they were different, they would say they are the same kind. I'd actually be interested in running an experiment sometime, produce a bunch of replicas of these skulls, and show them to creationists two at a time, and ask them whether they have two individuals that are the same kind or different kinds, and see whether they are actually capable of differentiating. 
And AIG will happily admit that Homo's erectus, Heidelbergensis, and Neanderthalensis are all human, but the farther back you go, the less agreement there is, even in Answers in Genesis' own Answers Research Journal. Dr. Todd Wood concluded in one paper that Australopithecus sediba belongs to the human category and should be renamed Homo sediba, but in a discussion of that paper published a few months later in the same journal, other creationist researchers disagree and think that it belongs in the ape category. Now, now, papers coming to opposite conclusions being published in the same journal doesn't necessarily mean that the journal is a bad journal and cannot be trusted, it is actually quite normal for scientists to disagree with each other. But you can't go around saying that it's either fully ape or fully human, when your own researchers can't even agree on which ones are ape and which ones are human. And of course this is one of those spots where transitional does not mean that it is a transition from apes to humans. No, humans are a category of apes. This Transition simply shows the development of the characteristics that define a human ape and differentiate between human apes and non-human apes. For instance, the less pronounced brow ridges. You can't look at all these skulls in order and not see that the brow ridges consistently get smaller. But hey, ask Answers in Genesis and they'll tell you that these two skulls, one from Homo sapiens and the other from Homo habilis, are of the same kind. But these two skulls, habilis and Australopithecus africanus, are from different kinds. Now, I don't know about you, but it looks to me like Homo habilis is way closer to Australopithecus africanus than it is to modern humans, and yet AIG says that they are two distinct kinds, but the habilis is just a different subcategory of human. Although museums and textbooks and movies may try to represent ancient humans as more ape-like or ancient apes as more human-like than the bones alone would indicate. The bones alone indicate that species of human that AIG agrees are fully human have more in common with some species that AIG thinks are fully ape than they do with modern humans, but sure, go ahead and pretend like there's a clear line separating the two categories. Likewise, the linked resources explain how the supposed dino bird fossil Archaeopteryx was an interesting but unequivocal bird. A bird that has a bony tail, like reptiles, but unlike modern birds, and teeth like dinosaurs, but unlike modern birds. An analysis of its fossils show that its blood vessel growth patterns match dinosaurs, but not modern birds. Its skull connects to the spine at the base, like reptiles, rather than at the back, like birds. It's missing the keratin horn cover on the maxilla and premaxilla, a feature that all extant birds share. And I could go on. There are many features of Archaeopteryx that would place it in the reptile category rather than in the bird category, were it not for those pesky features that it has that would place it in the bird category rather than the reptile category. Almost like it's a transition between the two or something and Tiktaalik, which allegedly represented an ancestor of land animals, was simply a fish. Tiktaalik was a fish. Contrary to that popular image of it crawling out of the water that has now become a meme for not liking work days, it likely was fully aquatic and lived in shallow swampy water sitting on the bottom, using its strong fins to prop its head up and grab prey as it swam above it. But those prop yourself up adaptations are the kinds of adaptations that are easily adaptable for life on land. And that's the point. It wouldn't take much modification of a tiktaalik fin to make it useful for locomotion on land. After all, there are plenty of fish alive today that use similar fins for that exact purpose. Catfish, mudskippers, other blennies, and bashir are the ones that come immediately to mind. Scenario 2, the fossil is made of bones from different specimens belonging to separate kinds. That does happen on occasion, which is why researchers generally don't place a lot of confidence in a species that are based on a single fossil find. The more specimens you find, the less likely it is that all the same bones got jumbled together in the same way in multiple different locations. This is especially possible if the bones were found in different locations. This is likely referring to the common creationist claim that the Australopithecus knee joint that is attributed to the Lucy specimen was found several kilometers away from the rest of the skeleton and in a much lower strata. So creationists claim that this knee joint was actually a human knee and was assumed to belong to Lucy, thereby proving that she walked upright when she did not. There are a number of issues with this claim, first among them is that even if they were correct, and it was a misidentified human knee, the knee is by no means the only evidence of Lucy's bipedal locomotion. But the biggest problem with this claim is the fact that it's just flat out not true. It likely has its origin in a misunderstanding of a question and answer given by Dr. Johansson, Lucy's discoverer, after a lecture in 1986. 
Dr. Johansson was asked, How far away from Lucy did you find the knee? To which he replied, 60 to 70 meters lower in the strata and 2 to 3 kilometers away. So, how does that not mean that Lucy's knee was found kilometers away from the rest of the skeleton? Easy. Whatever the original questioner might have meant by the question, Dr. Johansson clearly took it as asking how far away from Lucy was the 1973 knee joint found. Lucy was found in 1974, complete with the knee joint that is shown in all the pictures of her skeleton. The 1973 knee joint is, and always has been, documented as a completely separate find, which of course serves to corroborate the structure of Lucy's knee as being accurate. And other knee joints have been found with other Afarenza skeletons as well, so that also confirms the structure of Lucy's knee. Or even in the case of forgeries. For instance, the infamous Piltdown Man skull was forged from human and orangutan bones. Yes, and the reason it worked for as long as it did was because it fit with the prevalent idea of the time, that humans evolved in Europe, and that brain size increased before jaw size decreased. Now, aside from the fact that it was not universally accepted as genuine, and actually was challenged by many scientists of the time, some of which even correctly identified the fact that it was a human skull with an orangutan mandible, do you know why we eventually figured out that it was fake? Because as we discovered more and more early hominids, the picture of human evolution became much more clear. Not only did we not evolve in Europe, but the jaw shrank before the brain was embiggened. Embiggens? Hmm. I never heard that word before I moved to Springfield. I don't know why. It's a perfectly cromulent word. So our discovery of how humanity really evolved is what ultimately ousted Piltdown Man. But creationists don't like to tell that part of the story. Can't think why. Finally, scenario three, the fossil represents another separate kind with a mosaic of features resembling those of other organisms and reflecting creatures shared designer. So a repeat of scenario one? I don't see how this is really any different from it may look like it's transitioning between kinds, but really it is its own kind. Platypuses, for instance, have characteristics spanning multiple animal groups. Not really, mostly just mammals and reptiles. Almost like it's a rather basal transitional form between mammals and reptiles. Which also serves to drive home the point that I made earlier about how any one transitional form is not necessarily the ancestor of all future developments of that form. The platypus is a great example of some aspects of the transition from reptile to mammal, even though it is sitting there existing at the same time as a bunch of other mammals. So with these three possibilities in mind, you can look closer at observational science to see if there's more to the transitional fossil story. For instance, linked articles explain how a biblical explanation makes much more sense of the abrupt appearances of many living things and their distinguishing features in the fossil record. Using the date range that Answers in Genesis says are the accepted start and end dates for the Cambrian explosion, it took place over a period of 37 million years. Now certainly the Cambrian explosion is rather abrupt geologically speaking, but 37 million years is a long ass time, and there's also a multi-billion year history of life that goes back before the Cambrian, so an extra long ass time. On top of that, for most of this history, the critters that existed were small and simple. Bones were rare, and bones are the easiest thing to fossilize. So it's not like we have no evidence of any life existing until suddenly it all showed up in the Cambrian. It's more like the fossil record is rather sparse until the body parts that are easier to fossilize evolved. Which makes sense if you spend a moment thinking about it. And really, the body plans that showed up in the Cambrian have more primitive precursors with a history that predates the explosion by about 30 million years. The real question with the Cambrian explosion is not why there is a sudden appearance of fossils, it's a question of what could have prompted such rapid diversification. They didn't come out of nowhere, like creationists imply, they clearly developed from earlier pre-Cambrian forms, but the diversification did happen quickly, evolutionarily speaking. But besides which, creationists would love to be able to say that all the major phyla developed in the Cambrian, because then you picture modern examples of these phyla suddenly popping into existence, but that's just not how it was. For instance, this less than 40 millimeter long weird eel looking thing is the oldest representative of the chordates. So this guy represents the appearance of all the chordata phylum, which includes everything with a spinal cord, all mammals, reptiles, birds, fish, etc. So yeah, not quite the miraculous appearance of everything all at once that creationists want you to picture. 
In the last episode, I also mentioned that evolutionary dates for rock layers surrounding fossils don't always support a straightforward evolutionary explanation. Depends what you mean by straightforward. If you're about to bring up things like the earliest tetrapod footprints predating Tiktaalik, that's easily explained by the fact that the evolution of a new trait does not automatically make the old trait go away, and sometimes we find a newer example of an organism with an older trait rather than an older example. This is why phylogenies are drawn with unnamed common ancestors linking different species together rather than naming common ancestor species, because we have no way of knowing which species actually are the common ancestors and which just look like they could be. For example, Tiktaalik is considered younger than fossil footprints of a four-footed animal which supposedly came after Tiktaalik. No, nobody says that. I've already explained that, the footprints are the oldest known tetrapod footprints, so yes, this does mean that Tiktaalik itself is not the common ancestor of all tetrapods, but this does not lessen the significance of finding a creature from around the same time period with adaptations that could have been useful for land-based locomotion. Evolutionists could speculate that Tiktaalik's ancestors were transitional forms, but the point is, observational science doesn't necessarily match what a straightforward evolutionary scenario would predict. Evolution does not predict perfect, straightforward scenarios. That's just how our brains like to picture things. Just because you don't understand how to read a phylogeny does not mean that the phylogeny is wrong. That's why, although textbooks may still show linear diagrams of transitional fossil series, modern evolutionists usually believe that transitional forms follow branching patterns rather than linear sequences. Ah, okay, so you do understand that it's not a simple linear progression. Now, I can't speak to what modern textbooks are showing in their evolutionary diagrams, but if they are showing it as a linear progression, I would be happy if they stopped that, because this whole argument goes away if you just never present the information in a way that is so easy to misunderstand. Because that's all this argument is. I don't understand phylogenetics, therefore it must be a linear progression, but some things came before their oldest known specimen, so the linear progression must must be wrong, so evolution is wrong. And that's just a stupid argument. And really it relies almost entirely on your audience just having a vague awareness of learning the linear progression picture of evolution in school, so that when you present this branching tree pattern that has always been understood to be how evolution works, it comes across as scientists trying to make evolution work with post hoc rationalization when the reality is, if anything, a failure of the educational system that left students with the impression that the linear model was right. And this is even true of the famous horse and whale fossil series that you still see in a lot of textbooks. Yes, it is true. And again, I can't speak to how the textbooks are presenting it, but when I search for whale evolution diagrams online, the only version of the diagram that does not connect them through unknown common ancestors in the tree or bush-like fashion is the one found on creationwiki.org. The horse diagram is quite a bit worse, unfortunately. There are a few that show the relationships as they should, but far too many exist that make it look linear, so I'd be happy to have that one swapped out in the textbooks. And even for the most supposedly straightforward sequences, like the presumed reptile to mammal transition, transitional features don't develop smoothly often as textbooks would suggest. Sure, they don't always develop smoothly, but they do develop. It actually is quite amazing that the fossil record is as complete as it is, given how few organisms are actually preserved in it. So my own first year biology textbook said this. The fossil record shows that the unique features of mammalian jaws and teeth evolved gradually over time in a series of steps. The book added, if all the known fossils in this sequence were arranged by shape and placed side by side, their features would blend smoothly from one group to the next. Yeah, kind of like I did with the skulls showing the evolution of humans from earlier non-human primates like the Australopithecine. Is it as smooth as it could be? No. But it's smooth enough that even dedicated creationist researchers can't decide where to draw the line between human and ape, a line that they insist should be clear as day. Actually, geologist John Woodmorap did arrange these fossils by evolutionary date back in 2001. As his linked research paper concluded, one of the most striking findings uncovered by this analysis is that the majority of anatomical traits, the ones actually used by evolutionists in the construction of their cladograms, do not show a unidirectional progression towards the mammalian condition. 
The reptile-mammal transition, which might more properly be called the amniotherapsid transition, with the sauropsids that led to reptiles branching off from the amniotes before the synapsids developed, but reptile-mammal has a nicer ring to it. But this is one of the most well-documented major transitions. And of course the resource that you're saying to check out makes the critical error of considering the whole thing as one single linear chain, rather than a branching phylogeny. All the while, looking at all of the anatomical features simultaneously, assuming that they would all have developed in sequence, and also assuming, and pretending that this assumption is the evolutionary view, that all of the creatures represented share a direct ancestral relationship. Obviously if you start with such critically flawed assumptions, you will arrive at a critically flawed conclusion. Many mammal-like traits disappeared and reappeared throughout the sequence, and large evolutionary gaps occurred in the few traits that did progress linearly. As far as traits that are disappearing and reappearing, that's due to the non-linear nature of evolution. Like I said, we don't know which species were the actual ancestors of which other species, we are just looking for representatives that show the traits that are indicative of the transition. So it is entirely expected that not every representative of what would have been a much larger group of organisms than the fossil record shows would have whatever trait we're looking for at the same time of development at all times. Even after Patricia herself explained that the quote-unquote evolutionist view doesn't hold a linear progression, but instead opts for a branching tree or bush-like pattern, she is still stuck on refuting the linear progression. To simplify, think of a character trait like blue eyes. If one person in a family has blue eyes, will everyone in the family have blue eyes? No. So if you take a random sampling of that person, their descendants, their cousins, and their cousins' descendants, you may find that blue eyes seem to disappear and reappear. This does not mean that they don't all share a common ancestor that carried the mutation that results in blue eyes, it just means that not all of them have inherited the trait for themselves, though they may be carriers of the gene without the gene expressing itself. This is of course an oversimplification, but it is the same general idea, just with a much larger family and looking at more than one trait. Crossing those large gaps would require gaining functional new genetic information. Which is something that happens all the time. But really it's not about having more genetic material, it's about what the genetic material does. Sometimes a mutation that results in a loss of genetic material will cause a new function. Sometimes the amount will stay the same, and sometimes there will be more of it. This fact has actually made my life difficult when dealing with creationists, because I like to use examples that refute their points, but researchers don't generally concern themselves with whether a particular new function resulted in more or less genetic material, so that information is usually buried deep within technical papers. The important aspect of the research that is front and center is the new function, whether that be a single-celled algae developing multicellularity as a stably heritable character trait, E. coli developing the ability to metabolize citrate, or fruit flies adapting to be more successful when living in complete darkness, both in finding mates and in sensing their environments. Really what it comes down to is that we know of several mechanisms that add genetic material into an organism's genome. Horizontal gene transfer, retroviral infection, insertion events, duplication events, etc. So when looking at a new function developing in an organism, the type of mutation that created that function is of secondary importance. But really, if you want an example of information being added into a genome resulting in a new function, placental pregnancy is a perfect example, where proteins that are coded for using retroviral DNA are an important part of the process, promoting cell fusion and modulating the immune system in the placenta. So another useful question is, okay, what else would have had to happen for this fossilized creature to transform into another kind? Well, no one creature transformed into another kind. It's all about the gradual accumulation of features over successive generations. Think lactose tolerance. That was a mutation that happened about 8,000 years ago, right around the time when humans started domesticating milk-producing animals, and it slowly spread through the population until today when about 35% of the human population are able to digest milk into adulthood. That's a minor change, and it has taken thousands of years to reach a minority of the population, and yet most people of European descent take their ability to digest lactose for granted. 
It is possible that this mutation will be a key foundation for some future unknown mutation that will provide yet another function. Evolution is really good at co-opting existing material for different purposes, a process known as exaptation. And important mutations are often found to have had precursor mutations that did not have a dramatic effect themselves, but they were critical for later mutations. For instance, the mutation that gave the ability to metabolize citrate to E. coli happened around generation 30,000. But on closer inspection, the mutation the mutation that led to that mutation even being possible happened around generation 20,000, but did not itself produce a noticeable effect. To quote the researchers, we suggest that historical contingency is especially important when it facilitates the evolution of key innovations that are not easily evolved by gradual cumulative selection. And does observational science support such transformations being possible? Yes, overwhelmingly so. Finally, for check number seven, check the logic, we can identify circular reasoning in arguments that transitional fossils are evidence of evolution because the word transitional itself assumes evolution is happening. It is not circular reasoning to rely on well-established science to draw your conclusions. This would be like claiming that the statement planets orbit the sun is circular reasoning because the word orbit itself assumes that gravity is a thing. Transitional fossils are evidence for evolution, just as the orbits of the planets are evidence for gravity. Even saying that evolution predicts intermediate forms, and intermediate forms exist, therefore evolution must be true, well that's using the affirming the consequent fallacy discussed back in episode 47. Except the difference here is not just that evolution predicts the general concept of transitional forms, it also predicts exactly where they can be found. Tiktaalik, for instance, was found based on prediction. We had never found a non-fish vertebrate fossil that was 390 million years old, but there were terrestrial tetrapods that were around 360 million years old. So it was predicted that something like Tiktaalik would be found in between those two dates. What's more, the type of environment that it was likely to be found in was predicted. The researchers who went to Ellesmere Island to find it were not just digging randomly looking for any old fossil, they went there specifically to look for something Something like Tiktaalik, and they found it. Important finds like this are almost always deliberately looked for based on predictions that the theory of evolution makes. It is a rare thing indeed to have one of these important finds be a complete coincidence. Ultimately, a little biblical critical thinking reveals that, far from being proof of evolution, intermediate looking fossils often cause problems for evolution. They only cause problems in the sense that sometimes we have to re-examine the timeline to make sure it's correct. That's the whole willing to change our minds when presented with new evidence thing. Yet are consistent with biblical interpretations. Only superficially, if you ignore the vast majority of the data. Hell, not even then, because AIG can't decide where the line is between human and ape when looking at the fossil record. A line that they claim repeatedly is clear and obvious. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Doc Will, who says, A college freshman with Geology 101 can take his argument apart. This guy is really low-hanging fruit. Now, it's hard to tell tone from text, I can't tell if this is a criticism of me for tackling the low-hanging fruit, or if it's just a comment on the general quality of creationist apologetics, given that this was on a video where I responded to one of the creationist bigwigs. But either way, the low-hanging fruit is frequently the best arguments that are exposed to the general creationist population. Most of them don't go to the Answers Research Journal and read through all the technical-sounding papers. They watch things like the 700 Club, which just give oversimplified and erroneous summaries of the arguments, which can be torn apart without even getting Geology 101 under your belt. I personally try to get a mixture of the two, so I can respond to the arguments that they are more likely to be directly exposed to, but also so I can go more in-depth into some of the quote-unquote better arguments to show how they really don't work either. Thanks for watching, thanks to this week's PayPal hero Edward, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the transitional forms that prove the evolution of my channel. If you'd like to assume that the evolution of my channel is true, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form or listen to my podcast with my daughter, the links for those are also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!